Why would ferritin be extremely high when transferrin saturation is low? Hi, I'm Chris Masterjohn and I have a PhD in nutritional sciences. I am not a medical doctor and nothing contained in this episode may be construed as medical or nutritional advice of any kind or a substitute therefore. This episode is meant purely as scientific education. If you wish to act on any ideas presented in this episode, please consult your physician first and never take anything herein as a reason to contradict medical advice. With that said, enjoy the episode. Aaron Povman says, my husband's ferritin levels have been elevated on a few different occasions, most recently ferritin 603, that's massively high, transparent saturation 18, that's very low, especially given how high the ferritin is. I told the doctor to get an, a high sensitivity C-reactive protein, duh, but they just got a C-reactive protein uh, quantitative result less than one. Would you still recommend an HSCRP? Any other ideas behind the ideology besides inflammation since the transferrin saturation was low normal? Um, probably, uh, so first of all, you did excellently. Uh, that was a phenomenal interpretation of this. Um, it's, you know, it's great that the doctor listened to you. Um, and it's great that you spoke up about it. Uh, but, um, in terms of whether, so the difference here in the C-reactive protein high sensitivity is they report back less than one instead of reporting 0 0.3, 0 0.5. In this particular case, um, Aaron asks to clarify, 603 is still massively high, even though the range for males goes to 400. Yes, because 400 is massively high, and the range is slowly getting better, having been originally instituted to catch someone with hemochromatosis after they had metal deposits in their organs and organ damage from it when a biopsy might not have been done to show the metal deposits. Um, so in that case, a ferritin of 1,000 is pretty sensitive and specific for hemochromatosis as shown by metal deposits on the internal organs by biopsy. Um, but I think it's uh, ridiculously negligent to diagnose hemochromatosis after it's gone that far. Now, um, and so the, the, it shouldn't be less than a thousand. It should be insanely less than a thousand. Aaron also clarifies that he doesn't have the hemochromatosis genes on 23andMe. Okay. I don't think he has hemochromatosis. I'm just saying that uh, I think he doesn't have hemochromatosis because his transferrin saturation is 18%. Um, what I'm saying is that uh, Ferritin as a potential indicator of iron overload um, should not be anywhere near the level that was set to try to rule in biopsy provable hemochromatosis. That is, um, that is just profoundly negligent, negligent approach to setting the range for ferritin. Now, I think part of what has stopped, you know, I. This mostly is a problem of the binary diagnostic mindset of, of conventional medicine. So um, I'm not saying that this, is, that this mindset is not useful. Uh, it is tremendously useful, but too many people confuse it for a reality when in fact it is a reality distortion filter meant to more efficiently triage people through various treatments or non-treatments. Um, and so uh, nothing, you know, everything that is measured in the body is a continuous variable. So it is a reality distortion filter to categorize it across thresholds no matter what, because you're making a binary pass the threshold or not on a variable that's continuous. So whenever you have a binary threshold, uh, to categorize something into A and B when it's a continuous variable, you're distorting reality by doing so, which is fine because it's useful, but you have to acknowledge what you're doing. So in this particular case, um, the reality distortion filter they were using was we want to triage people between this result indicates, you know, is good to use as a, pro as a proxy or as a 
indicator um, that had we measured the biopsy or if we measure the biopsy of the liver, we will find biopsy provable hemochromatosis. Um, but there is a lot of, you know, a lot of research has been done since then for why we would want to optimize the actual iron uh, distribution and iron metabolism and why we would want to use a ferritin of 600 or 400 or even 300 as a potential red flag of something going wrong in iron metabolism rather than waiting to the point where the person has died, you know, has to have a, something replaced in their internal organs because they are retrospectively diagnosed as having hemochromatosis. Um, so I think it's very negligent to diagnose hemochromatosis retrospectively rather than to try to catch it before it causes organ damage, uh, first of all. But then second of all, even if we're going to say, okay, we need to have this threshold for, you know, and that's why you've seen the labs reference range go down and down. Like it's 400 now. Well, I don't know if all labs do it the same, but not that long ago, 600. And not that long, you know, so at some point before that, I believe it was a thousand, at least, at least in a textbook that I have, they use a thousand as a, as a threshold. So um, the problem is when we set, when we use the labs cutoff as a, as an indicator of the reality, actually it was a, you know, it was a reality distortion filter imposed on reality for the purpose of having a blood proxy for biopsy for retrospectively diagnosing hemochromatosis. Um, and so the reality is when a ferritin is 600, you can be absolutely certain that something is off from optimal iron metabolism. It's just not clear what it is. So it might be iron overload that is 60% on its way to 1000 ferritin and, you know, guarantee of biopsy provable hemochromatosis, but it may also be, to get back to your question, it may also be inflammation as you very well tried to fetter out. Um, and if it's not that, it's probably oxidative stress. So I'm not going to say that's the only other thing it could be. Um, and for the record, you cannot rule out hemochromatosis genetics with 23andMe or any other genetic test by anyone because there are um, a small percentage of hemochromatosis genetics that are not in the HFE genes and no one has a panel for them. Um, and so it's, you, it's improbable that it's hemochromatosis based on 23andMe, but you can't rule it out. But I would say it's probably not hemochromatosis because his iron saturation is low. Uh, and so, you know, I'm highly suspicious of oxidative stress, which also upregulates ferritin. I would have... Uh, if you have testing nutritional status, the ultimate cheat sheet, I would measure everything in the oxidative stress section, um, lipid peroxides and 8-hydroxydeoxyguanosine and glutathione would all be good places to start. And uh, um, F2 isoprostanes, depending on who you're working with, might also be a, a good thing to measure in an initial quantification. I believe F2 isoprostanes is done by the Boston Heart Lab. Uh, whole blood glutathione can be done by LabCorp. I'm not sure off the top of my head who else besides Genova does lipid peroxides and 8 hydroxydeoxyguanosine. If you get a Genova ion panel, it will have glutathione, lipid peroxides, and 8 hydroxydeoxyguanosine. It will not have F2 isoprostanes. Again, you can get those from the Boston Heart Lab. Um, and then there are, there are other things in the intestine nutritional status, the ultimate cheat sheet that could be looked at, but I think enter as a mini panel to try to see whether it's plausible that oxidative stress is, is the issue, then I think those four things would be the best place to start. All right, Aaron, I hope I helped. Thank you very much for your question. This episode was part of a Q&A for members of the CMJ Masterpass, a buyer's club with exclusive and massive discounts on your favorite premium foods and health products, including pasture-raised and wild meat and seafood, supplements, sleep accessories, water filters, phototherapy devices, and much more. As a bonus, you also get to participate in monthly private Zoom Q&As with me. You can join the Masterpass at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash masterpass and use the code Q&A, spelled out as Q-A-N-D-A, Q&A, for a 10% lifetime discount. 
For the remainder of 2020, I will be working full-time on finishing my Vitamins and Minerals 101 book while reserving a portion of my time for consulting clients. You can pre-order my book at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash book. In my consulting, I am neither a medical practitioner nor a coach. I serve as your data analyst and your strategist. I teach you scientific principles of health and wellness, help you analyze your data, and help brainstorm actionable strategies. You can sign up for a consultation at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash consultations. I will try to respond to comments here when I can, but my presence will be intermittent while I'm finishing my book. I hope you enjoyed this, and I will see you in the next episode.